It's good to see you all. Appreciate the presence of each and every one of you here. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew, the fifth chapter this morning. Matthew chapter 5, we'll be beginning this morning in earnest our theme for the year, and that is the year with Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, normally, it is the first Sunday of every month, but we d- began this, uh, this month with a five, it's a five Sunday month, so we began this month with an overview of the sermon, fitting in one extra lesson, and because I'll be out of town next week, we'll do the first one the second Sunday, and normally what we do second Sunday, third Sunday, and you, you, get, you get the picture. Um, but again, we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes this morning. And at maybe the hurt of my own sermon, I need to preface this with, this was not the end-all, be-all of the Beatitudes. In fact, really, I'm probably going to shortchange them this morning, because each of these Beatitudes deserves a lesson in of themselves. Um, and really, we should be spending the next 13 or 14 weeks on them. But uh, we're, the goal here is to get the big picture of the sermon and not be in an exhaustive concordance or a commentary on this text. And so if you want to turn to Matthew 5, we'll be starting in verse uh, 1. And we'll read the whole reading to verse 12. And seeing the multitudes... He went up on a mountain, and when he uh, was seated with his disciples, uh, excuse me, when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth, saying, and taught them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be set filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. One of the goals we're going to be looking at on the Sermon on the Mount is what Jesus teaches about who disciples are, what disciples do, and where they are going or who they belong to. And so this morning, we, the sermon opens up with the character portrait of a disciple. At the forefront, we need to understand that these are not simply eight or nine or ten, depending on how you want to divide the Beatitudes, separate persons in the kingdom with eight or ten separate blessings for these people. This is a composite picture of who a disciple is. But before we dig into the meat, we probably need to go over what that word blessed means. Um, So the sense of the word carries the idea primarily of one who receives divine favor. Some of your other translations may, be, may say happy, and that's not really the primary sense of the word. It's in there, but it's not the primary sense. It's, the, it's one who receives divine favor. The happiness comes from the fact that we have received divine favor. It's the privilege and the happiness that one is blessed by God. And that's kind of a long way of saying, if we were to read down the text, you know, one who receives divine favor is the one who is poor in spirit, and you know, that, that's not as pithy as blessed are. Uh, but that meaning was clearly understood in the original, for the original audience. In fact, if we just consider a few different translations, uh, do you see that all senses of this word it comes out depending on what translation or paraphrase you're looking at? For example, Young's literal has it happy the poor in spirit. If you want, as the name implies, if you want something that's as close to word for word, as possible, Young's Literal is, is your translation. It's going to read like a brick of wood, a block of wood, though. Uh, it doesn't it supply the, the, uh, the italicized words in our Bibles to make it flow better. Uh, the New Living Translation, for example, in Matthew 5, in verse 3, God blesses those, so there's the idea of divine favor, who are poor and realize their need for Him. And I will say right now that I believe the New Living hit the nail on the head on, on that verse. And also the, the, the Living Bible, the paraphrase, has it of humble men are very fortunate. 
So this idea of happiness, divine favor, fortune, privilegedness is all there in that word, and different translations bring it out. But what are the qualities that bring about the sense of divine favor, that bring about the sense of privilege and blessing that come upon those who receive this favor? We'll go through the Beatitudes once, just looking at the character traits, and we'll go through them again, looking at the blessings that are attached to these character traits. So starting off, the character of the disciples. As I mentioned a moment ago, that the, this character portrait is that of every disciple. And his character is to match that of his king. Because really, if you dig through, and I would suggest maybe this week or month studying this, Go through each and beatitude and you will find Christ himself. This is an autobiographical sketch of his own character. He possessed all of these. He was gentle and lowly. He mourned over the sins of the world. He was meek. He was a peacemaker. He was utterly devoted to God. Hence why Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 25, our character, it's enough to be like our master. He said, it's enough for a disciple to be like his teacher and a servant his master. And so this is the character we need to be taking on. And so it begins with the very first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This is the fundamental character trait, condition to enter the kingdom. If one does not have this beatitude, one does not possess the rest. If one is lacking this, one cannot enter the kingdom of God. If anyone lacks this, he is removed or stays removed from God. And the poor in spirit there is those who know their spiritual condition without God. Those who have recognized their total and utter spiritual bankruptcy. And they are in desperate need for Jehovah. I turn your back again to the New Living Translation because, again, it hit it on the head. God God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him. The International Children's Bible has it as those people who know they have great spiritual needs. Those are the ones blessed by God. Are you poor in spirit? Have you recognized your deep spiritual needs without God? That there is a hole in your soul that needs to be filled and fixed? That as Caleb read this morning from Isaiah, that even Isaiah, a prophet of God, one who followed the law, we may infer even him, when face to face with the reality of things, says, woe is me, wretched man that I am, for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips living in a generation of men of unclean lips. I would suggest to you that this character trait is best uh, exemplified by the prodigal son. When he finally came to his right mind and went back to his father, he says, I'm no good to be even called one of your servants. Simply take me back in, I'll be one of your servants, and I'll be fine. I can't do anything without you. And this character trait that goes into the next one, that is, blessed are the mournful, or those who mourn. They're not talking about a, a general mourning, those who have wet eyes all the time and cry at every little thing. But it's directly connected to the first beatitude. It's those who mourn over their spiritual condition. One can recognize their loss without God and not, not care. <laughs> uh, one can recognize a clear teaching of Scripture and just say, I, I know it says, I don't, I don't believe it. I don't care about it. It's another thing to be moved from, moved from that understanding to the mourning over that fact. If you look in 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 11. In 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter in verse 11. With King Josiah. He is one that I, I think we would agree that was poor in, uh, poor in spirit. He recognized his great need for God even from a young age. And that eventually moved him to mourn over that condition. Because when they found the book of the law during the restoration of the temple, and it was brought before the king, and it was read, the text reads this. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. That was a universal sign, and 
what one did when one was overcome with immense grief and mourning over a situation. He is so full of agony and anguish and mourning over the fact that he has heard the word of the law and he recognizes we're not doing it, that he just he doesn't know what to do other than he's ripping his garments and he's in tears. Now, I'm not saying you need to do that this morning. But Josiah epitomizes what it means to be mournful. Those in the kingdom are also meek. Matthew 5 and verse 5, blessed are the meek. As one writer said, meekness is not weakness. In fact, that word meek there in the original language carried the idea of it was applied to an animal, that had been, a wild animal that had been broken and tamed. Think of a wild stallion that had finally been broken and tamed and brought underneath control of the bridle and the bit. All that power is still there. All the muscle, all that raw power that was there when it was a wild animal, it's still there. It's just now under control. Jesus himself, who could call 10,000 angels at the crucifixion if he so chose, who could do all things and did all things well, who was at, had the power to do whatever he wanted, is called the most meekest man who ever lived. He was under, he had full control over self. Now for the disciple, the meek citizen of the kingdom is one who has been tamed by the yoke of Christ, been brought under subjection to that yoke. They no longer act on every impulse and desire of the, of the uh, old man of sin, that nature but his, desires, uh, but his desires are in subjection and under control of his master doing his will. These are people who know themselves and are in control of themselves. The hungry and the thirsty. As we can see, I hope we're seeing that these are all kind of tied back to that very first beatitude. Those who recognize their condition without God. The, poor, uh, the person who is poor in spirit would naturally have a hunger for that which they lack. The righteousness that only God can provide. This just, beatitude doesn't describe a, a person who wants just a right relationship with God, but also wants to do right by God. And we see in verse 7, blessed are the merciful. This mercy is not simply those who show pity for pity's sake, but those, it's a mercy that is deeply rooted in the mercy that God has first shown them. They understand their condition without God in the first beatitude. They have mourned over that condition. They are hungry and thirsty for that condition to be changed. And they're mindful when that mercy is shown that they have received something that by no means they were worthy or deserving of. And that mercy spills out to their fellow man. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. In fact, later on in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, looking at verses 14 and 15. Matthew, the sixth chapter, starting in verse 14, and we'll read verse 15 as well. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I would say to you, this is this beatitude spelled out in a little bit more detail. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's like the parable of the, un, uh, uh, the, parable of the two servants, who both were in great amount of debt, one more than the other. Um, and the one servant goes to his master. He has more debt than he can ever pay in his lifetime. And he begs for the master. He recognizes he can do nothing about this debt. He begs the master, please forgive me of the debt, and the master does so. Then this servant go finds another servant who owns him not nearly as much as he owned his master. You might think the first servant owned several million dollars to the master, and this other servant owned ten dollars to this other servant. The first servant, who was forgiven much, found this other servant, grabbed him by his collar, and started beating him and said, pay back what you owe me. And when he couldn't pay him back, he said, we're going to throw you in debtor's prison. You can come out. When the master found out, that first servant was promptly executed. That was told to illustrate this point. 
that we who are forgiven much ought to be a forgiving people. And if we are not a forgiving people, we have told we do not receive the forgiveness of God. Hence why kingdom citizens are ready to forgive, willing to forgive, and eager to forgive. Because they know to the degree they show forgiveness is the same degree that God will show them forgiveness. In a real sense of after being in relationship with Him. Because really, if we go on being vengeful and spiteful after forgiven much, we clearly have not understood how much has been forgiven and clearly have not understood the gospel. But this next beatitude in verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, and I'll jump ahead to the, to the blessing attached to it. It's, to me, the most exciting one is the fact that they shall see God. Think about that. Again, from Isaiah 6 this morning, we read how Isaiah saw just a glimpse of God and he went nearly insane. And yet here we have the beatitude of blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, in the real sense, we will see him face to face in the hereafter. But in a very real sense in this life, we see him by faith. We have the revealed word. We see him move in his people and in, in nature in various different ways. We see the act and the goodness and mercy of God and also his fierce power. Anytime a monsoon rolls through with intent, I mean, I don't know if it, most of you should have been in the middle right when the monsoon's right over your house or something. That, that is just a drop in the bucket of the power and fierceness of God. But also we've seen the beautiful sunset that comes after those monsoons sometimes and how serene and peaceful it is. That is also just a small taste of God's goodness and mercy. But this idea of pure in heart isn't necessarily just purity in action, although I believe it's included in that, but purity in devotion. Jesus said later in the Sermon on the Mount in verse 24 of Matthew 6, Matthew 6 and verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or despise the one and serve the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or God and wealth. And you can teach him about our possessions there, but God is seeking in the kingdom to have fierce loyalty to him and him alone. He will accept nothing less. Blessed are the peacemakers in verse 9. Again, I can't help but say the Beatitude. They will be called sons of God. They will be identified with God's family, not just cousins or nephews or something, but his children. That means brothers and sisters with his only begotten. And it's not just simply those who make peace in a general way. Um, it's not simply... I don't need to go into detail on this, but this verse has been readily abused in the last five to ten years, applying it to things that never meant to be applied to. This verse is talking about those who bring about true, lasting peace. Not a superficial peace of being a skilled negotiator of, of, of settling quarrels, but those who bring the true, lasting peace of the gospel. Paul himself in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, refers to the gospel of, the, the gospel of peace and of reconciliation. The fact that you were once an enemy of God and you have now been brought near to him. You once had a division between you because of our sins and now you have been brought to him and made peace with your maker. And then the Beatitudes end in a startling way. Here we have all those character traits of this sounds like a pretty decent person, even a worldly person who may not have the same goals as a citizen of the kingdom might say, okay, yeah, this person seems pretty admirable. We, may, we might want to live up to or try and be like this person. But then Jesus ends in Matthew, 10, Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are the persecuted. And he, it's a double beatitude. He says it twice. Again, you look back there in verse uh, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For, say they per- for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's interesting on the blessings, the Beatitudes begin and end with the same blessing. Theirs is the kingdom of God. But we might be asking, why would persecution come to such a group? Why does the Beatitudes end with the double blessing of enduring persecution? Brother Paul Earnhardt made an apt observation. I'm going to quote those words now. The reason they are persecuted is for a simple reason. Their crime is simple. They have chosen to be righteous in an unrighteous world. They are too much like their master. In the words of John, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1 and verse 5, John chapter 1 and verse 5, where he says there that the light shined in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or in John chapter 3, around verses 20 and 21, that the light has come into the world and that the world has hated it because it does not want their deeds exposed. So there's people who will be attracted to this kind of kingdom, a true lasting peace, a true righteousness, true blessing, true life is what Jesus is outlining here. But there are others for just the fact that a citizen of the kingdom will remind them so much of their own poverty without God. It will meet, be met with hostility. Kind of transitioning to the blessing then. Jesus says here then that for those who are persecuted, theirs is the kingdom. Not only that, you are in good company. For all the righteous prophets of old were persecuted like you are. And you should rejoice not in the fact that you're being persecuted. I don't think Andrew, the apostle, was rejoicing and had a giddy feeling when he was being crucified. Or Bartholomew, if memory serves me correctly, correctly, when he was being flayed alive. But they did rejoice in the fact that their reward in heaven is great because they were counted worthy to suffer shame and reproach for the cause of Christ. So what are the blessings then attached to this defined favor as we transition? Again, that word blessed, and those who receive the divine favor, if we might invert these all. Let's take verse 3, for example. Those who receive divine favor are the poor in spirit. And the proof of receiving the divine favor is the fact that you have the kingdom of God. It's kind of a circle here and tying back to the first word there. But let's look at these blessings again. The poor are blessed, in spirit, that is, because theirs is the kingdom. Those who mourn are blessed because they shall be comforted. And I will say to you, before I get too much further, each of these blessings has a, they have a now but yet aspect to them. There is the blessing received now, but there is the fuller blessing received later. We are currently in the kingdom of God. We are underneath his reign, his rule, we receive all the joys of fellowship with him, but yet there is still an aspect of the kingdom yet to come. When the new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem are brought down, when we will be in the true everlasting kingdom of heaven, never to be destroyed, never to be hurt, never to be mourning again. Likewise, with the comfort, there is immense comfort in Christ. There is immense, there is a balm for our ailments in Christ. And we receive that here and now, but there will be ultimate comfort when Christ comes again. We have the consolation, the comfort here, for example, on our sufferings and our ills in this life. We have the comfort in that Christ has promised one day to do something about all of it. And when that day comes, we'll have the ultimate comfort in that it will all be repaid. The meek shall inherit the earth. We need to think not of this as ruling in a worldly way. He is not promising that one day there will be a Christian majority in Congress, nor is he promising another Christian president. I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek. He's talking about those who are meek. As one writer said, they know the true value of things in this life. They are not beholden to possessions. They are not beholden to wealth or power. They simply can appreciate this world for what it is. 
Solomon and Ecclesiastes 2, around 26, said, After all the, the toil of man's labor, said, Eat, drink, and be merry, for that is what there is. For who can eat and drink without him, referring to God? He is the one who gives all blessings. It is a citizen of the kingdom who can recognize that, yes, this world is not everlasting, but why I'm here, God has given me the good things to enjoy. Take the covenant of marriage, for example. That has joys and bliss and heartache and, and wonders that many never experience and few truly do. God has made this wonderful union for this earth. But Jesus said in Matthew 19, uh, so Matthew, later on in the Gospel of Matthew, that even marriage one day will be gone. It will not exist in heaven. There will be no need for it. Uh, we'll be like the angels, he said. We are neither given in marriage nor married. Um, we'll live eternally in eternal bliss. And yet many in the world try and find their purpose and fulfillment and meaning in the other person. And they're wondering why they're disappointed because, well, you married another sinner, another flawed person. But the citizen of the kingdom recognizes marriage for what it is. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful blessing that God confers upon others and, and some not. But it's temporary. As much as I love chocolate cake and Dr. Pepper, my body doesn't agree with that, by the way, but I love it. It's going to go away one day. And I can, hopefully with the view of eternity, I can look at those things and appreciate those things for what they are. I need to enjoy it while I have it because one day it's going to be gone. And instead of being mournful and upset about that, as many in the world are, they want to hold on to things as long as possible, you can appreciate it for what it is. And so a person who can do that, Jesus says, the world is theirs. They get to enjoy it all. Uh, Friday night, uh, friends of mine, we were, we were downtown Tucson. A, a Broadway play was in at Centennial Hall, and so we went out to the dinner downtown. And it's also a Friday night and near the college, so I'll let you put two and two together. Uh, we were at Chipotle, and one friend commented says he just did not understand the need to document everything. Now, I don't have my cell phone on me for good reason, but... You had people walking in and in line, they're taking video and doing the selfies and everything. And I've seen it at concerts too, where they're recording the whole thing, which you're not allowed to do, but they do it. And my thought is, why would I want to experience life live through a screen? But instead, I can just enjoy it for what it is in the moment. How do people enjoy remember things before cameras? They were present there, and they, they took it all in, and they had the fond memories. It's those type of people that the earth is theirs. They'll get the true blessings and joys that come out of it. We've already talked about the merciful, but they shall obtain mercy. God directly tithes our receiving of mercy to how merciful we are. The pure in heart shall see God. They're in the kingdom, so they have the blessing of seeing him face to face one day in heaven, but we see him by faith now. The peacemakers, those who bring the gospel of peace, they'll be called sons of the Most High. The persecutor, the persecuted, as it began, so the Beatitudes end, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not the world, not those who would take it by force, which you cannot do, but those who have submitted to the yoke of Christ those who have made kingdom goals their goals. Um, and to be in Christ is to be in the kingdom. And to be in the kingdom is to begin to possess the character of the kingdom. God only requires the first beatitude to enter. You need to have a recognition of you yourselves are a sinner, and you, we, our only hope is Christ. That's why Paul, you know, we look at these blessings here this morning, you look at Ephesians 1 and verse 3 where he talks about how God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, blessing in the heavens in Christ. These character traits are all spiritual in nature and all these blessings have a spiritual component. These are all blessings attached with being in Christ. And so this morning we want to ask ourselves, 
What is the point of this section? What is the overall point that Jesus was making to the original audience as he began preaching this sermon? Now, we read all 12 of these 12 verses in rapid succession. We don't know how long Jesus spent on each one of these points. I'm not saying time about more words. The sermon could have just begun with Jesus going, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he could have waited 15 or 20 minutes to let that sink in, let people think about it, and then move on to the next beatitude. Jesus clearly was not doing what I'm doing this morning and expounding on all that there is to say about each of these Beatitudes. I believe these Beatitudes were to get people to grab their attention to get them to think about spiritual things. But that's not the main point that we want to emphasize or I think Christ is emphasizing here in this text. I think the main emphasis is that these Beatitudes represent a call. A call to make a radical, immediate, and clean break from the world we are living in. For if you look at these Beatitudes, they present traits and they elevate traits that the world does not view as desirable. Who wants to be meek when you can be powerful? Who wants to be merciful when you can be vengeful? Who wants to be persecuted when you can be the one persecuting. Now, they won't say it like this, but this is, and this is the fact. What the Beatitudes are, it's representing a counter-cultural understanding of how all, how things ought to be. And the, the irony is that if one possesses these character traits, you truly get what is best in life. You truly get the blessings and the good life. Not a life free of pain and suffering, by by no means. Uh, But you receive the divine favor of God and the blessings here and the hereafter. And the ultimate one, again, is they shall see God if you possess these. To possess one is to possess them all. And if you're here this morning, you possess that first one. You recognize your spiritual need without God, spiritual bankruptcy without God. You're willing to admit that, confess your sins, and Confess your faith in Christ and be united with him in the waters of baptism for remission of your sins. You can enter the kingdom of God this day. And you'll begin that beautiful process of once you possess that first character trait, it snowballs into all the, all the rest. Because if you possess that and you recognize your need for God, you're willing to commit this morning, you have that hunger and thirst for righteousness that saves. You have mourned over your sins. You are, you're already there to possessing the character of Christ. So if you have that need this morning, there is water ready. Maybe you've done so in the past and you need to return to good standing in the kingdom. You need to have your sins sins confessed. Or maybe you're struggling spiritually. Maybe you need the strength and encouragement of the saints to keep on going on the straight and narrow. Whatever you need, please, once you come, let's see every stand and sing the song that's been selected.